Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Coviello. I'm the Associate General Counsel for the National Fraternal Order Police Division of Labor Services. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're going to talk today about free speech issues, primarily the Garcetti versus Ceballos case. Um, as you can see from the screen, it's Garcetti versus Ceballos. Where are we now? This is an updated overview of police officers' right to free speech. This is by no means meant to be an exhaustive exhaustive coverage of every case and every jurisdiction. We're going to talk about, in a very basic way, an overview way of some of the cases that uh, have been decided in the last few years and um, give you some idea of, of what the right to free speech now is for public employees, spe uh, specifically police officers. And oftentimes we're going to get questions about, well, can I do blank? And the answer to that is generally going to be um, based upon what it is you intend to, to say, your role, and how you obtain the information, and whether or not it's related to your, to your job. There are no <clears throat> very good answers beyond don't be a test case. Um, and we're going to be talking about um, why that's the case. <clears throat> and primarily it's the case because the Supreme Court has left more questions than they have answers, and the lower courts have predominantly ruled in favor of employers and against the right to free speech. And at the very end of the presentation, we're going to briefly mention a case that is currently before the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and we're not sure how it's going to come out, although there are some folks who think it will go in favor of the employee in that case, but it remains to be seen. So uh, jumping right in, <clears throat> the first thing we want to do is uh, give authorship credit to Will Aitchison. Many of you may know who that is. He is the uh, publisher of Labor Relations Information System located in Portland, Oregon. Much of the research uh, that's in this presentation is based on the work that he's done. We work, the uh, Paternal Order Police, that is, works very uh, closely with uh, Will. And those of you who know him know what a uh, great uh, lawyer he is and the contribution he he has given to public employees. And uh, those of you who don't know him, uh, hopefully you get a chance to, uh, to hear him speak sometime soon at one of our seminars or one of his. So officers right to free speech. Speech is protected under the First Amendment as a result of penalties suffered by the colonists for criticizing the king uh, prior to the Revolutionary War. The law of the United States favors the free exchange of information and ideas, and the Founding Fathers believed that discourse and debate are beneficial to democracy. However, not all speech is protected. Uh, clearly, in order to be protected, the first uh, hurdle is that you must be speaking the truth or at least speaking in good faith. In other words, you can be wrong about whether or not it's true as long as you have a good faith belief that what you're saying is true. For example, yelling fire in a crowded movie theater and citing a riot in which people get hurt is not legal unless there is, in fact, a fire in the movie theater. We also have what, what are called time, place, manner restrictions. And we see this in terms of um, uh, street signs, um, billboards, uh, signs that advertise business. It's called commercial speech in that case. Um, in that you may be familiar with, uh, in your own jurisdiction, zoning regulations that require you to have a permit to put up a sign tells the permit um, dictates how big the sign can be and what can be actually on the sign. And one of the examples we like to give is if you were the owner of a gentleman's club, you could certainly advertise a gentleman's club on the side of the road on the sign, but you couldn't put a naked person on the sign for all the world to see. So that's an example of a, of a manner restriction um, in terms of the location, uh, place uh, of the sign, and the manner in which you uh, engage in the speech. And then there were also time restrictions where you have um, certain things that require permits for the time that you're going to host them. For example, a parade you, or, or a demonstration, a political demonstration. You're, you're entitled under the First Amendment to do those things, but the government is entitled to or has the power to limit when, where, and how. And when it comes to employment in at the very beginning of uh, speech, uh, free speech and employment decisions, we go back to 1968, the Pickering, Board of Educa Pickering versus Board of Education case. In that case, the United States Supreme Court entered into what was called a balance, or is called a balancing test, and has become known as the Pickering balancing test, a 
teacher was complaining about classroom size and criticizing the Board of Education, stating that the quality of education per student was significantly impacted by the fact that classrooms were becoming more and more crowded, resulting in individual attention to students being reduced and therefore affecting the quality of education. She was disciplined for making that comment. And in the balancing test, the court said that they have to balance the appropriate nature of the speech against the impact of the speech on, when I say speech, I'm not talking about giving a speech. I'm talking about the words used. The impact of the words used against the uh, uh, Board of Education or the employer's ability to maintain its mission and to continue to, to fulfill that mission. And in that particular case, the court said that uh, it was well within the employee's right to speak out about classroom size because he had specific knowledge of a, of a condition that was a matter of great public importance. And in exposing this problem, it actually enhanced the Board of Education's mission, that is, providing quality of education. There was nothing about what, what she said that hampered the Board of Education from doing its job. And so the case was resolved in favor of Pickering in that particular case. The Pickering balancing test was the law of the land until 2006 in the case of Garcetti versus Ceballos, which is now the most landmark case in First Amendment law uh, since that time. <clears throat> in that case, uh, it was, I'm going to sit, excuse me. Problem. There we go. Assistant District Attorney uh, alleged that he was a victim of retaliation because of a memorandum he wrote questioning the truthfulness of Deputy Sheriff's affidavits. Um, what happened in that particular case was uh, Ceballos, who was an, a, a filing attorney at the LA County District Attorney's Office, interviewed police officers who admitted that the affidavits that they had provided were false, that they were actually not truthful. When he informed these uh, officers that that was not only perjury, but that he would have to disclose it to the defense and that the case should not be filed, um, they objected. And as a result, Ceballos sent a memorandum up the chain of command through his supervisor uh, all the way up to Gil Garcetti. As a result, Garcetti terminated Ceballos. Ceballos sued based upon First Amendment retaliation, saying that he had an absolute right to, to speak this, uh, these words or write this memo because it was, in fact, a, a truthful statement. He had an obligation ethically under the rules of the California Bar to uh, only speak the truth in the matter in which he was filing uh, with the clerk of the court. He had an, um, a... Um, Brady obligation to turn over exculpatory evidence to the defense. And there was a whistleblower issue because he was, in fact, uh, told by his supervisor to file the case. And the memorandum came after the uh, conversation with the supervisor. The court ruled against uh, Ceballos by a 5-4 margin and said that the First Amendment offers no, employee, no protection to employees for speech made as a part of their job duties. Proper application of our precedent thus leads to the conclusion that the First Amendment does not prohibit managerial discipline based upon an employee's expressions made pursuant to official responsibility. Said another way, if your speech owes its origin or is derived from anything involving your job, your employer has the absolute right to control what you say and you don't get to make the decision. The first... Um, um, application or the first analysis that the court will go through is, are you speaking as an employee or are you speaking as a citizen? And if you're speaking as a citizen, are you speaking on a matter of great public importance? If you do not get past those two questions, you lose. That's just the way it is. If it's determined that your speech owes its duties, or owes its origin rather, to your duties, it is considered unprotected speech, even if you're speaking as uh, on a matter of great public importance. And we'll see some examples of this as it comes out. Um, the federal courts, as I said, have uh, been somewhat split on this. They mostly rule in favor of the employers and against the employees. Um, and most of these decisions focus on what the employee's duties were at the time of the speech. Unfortunately, as you'll see from the cases, there really is no bright line rule. 
Uh, and so that's why our best uh, advice at this point is still not to be a test case. If you feel compelled and something you need to say has to be said by somebody, take a close look at whether or not you should be the one saying. In this particular case, this is a 2008 case from the 11th Circuit. Uh, Schuster was a CPA employed by, as well as a finance director employed by Henry County, Georgia. He brought uh, concerns to the attention of the county attorney that one of the county commissioners was spending money illegally. He was spending money on his girlfriend and on trips uh, around the world that had absolutely nothing to do with his job. The attorney advised him to get on the agenda and on the public uh, comment portion of the agenda to bring it up at the next commission meeting, and he was terminated before the meeting took place. The court said, that to establish a claim of retaliation for protected speech under the First Amendment, public employee must show, among other things, that the employee spoke as a citizen addressing a matter of great public concern. Keep in mind that Schuster never got the opportunity to speak at the meeting. He had only at that point spoken with the county attorney. The county attorney is not his attorney, and therefore there was no attorney-client privilege. A government employee whose speech is made pursuant to official responsibilities enjoys no First Amendment protection upon which retaliation claims may be founded. And that's a direct quote from Garcetti. When public employees make statements pursuant to their official duties, the employees are not speaking as citizens for First Amendment purposes, and the Constitution does not insulate their communications from employer discipline. In other words, if the speech came from your job, you you're best off not saying anything about it. Whether the subject speech was made by the public employee speaking as a citizen or as part of the employee's job responsibilities is a question of law that the court decides. Like I said, you will never get in front of a jury if the court rules against you as to whether or not you are speaking as a citizen or as an employee. If it's resolved in favor of you being an employee, then you don't get before a jury. Internal affairs cases. These cases are probably the most disturbing because of the result of these cases, most of these employees were terminated and not reinstated. There's an officer giving a witness statement to an internal affairs investigator regarding the chief being intoxicated on duty and was terminated. The court dismissed the lawsuit. As a police officer, the employee had an official responsibility to cooperate with the investigation being conducted into the response, into the response to the incident. The officer's allegation of intoxication against the chief were made at no other time during this investigation and thus his speech was pursuant to his official and professional duties. We cannot find that the officer spoke as a citizen and thus he has no First Amendment action based upon his employer's reaction to this speech. In this case, um, speech made in mandatory internal affairs interview not protected by the First Amendment in the Pearson case. In the Burns case, Statements made in internal affairs process unprotected by First Amendment. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're sitting there. Wait a minute. They ordered me in. I have an absolute obligation under the rules of my agency to report violations. When ordered in, I have to comply. If I don't answer these questions, I get terminated or disciplined for insubordination. And now you're telling me if I go in there and I'm ordered to and I tell the truth and they decide to fire me, that I don't have First Amendment protection. And the answer is based upon these cases, that's correct. Uh, you may have a just cause defense that you can raise, and you can go into uh, arbitration if you're in a collective bargaining scenario. If you don't have collective bargaining and you have uh, a chief that's bent on retaliation for you saying something that was truthful that you were obligated or compelled to say, then unfortunately the First Amendment does not help you in, in these cases, which is why uh, some of these cases are very, very troubling. But there may be a light at the end of the tunnel, which we'll get to at the end. Um, more internal affairs cases. The Morales case. One officer's speech to another officer regarding alleged misconduct by police chief and deputy chief was made pursuant to the speaking officer's official duties and thus was unprotected under Garcetti. Another's officer's, another officer's speech to assistant attorney about the same alleged misconduct by the police chief and deputy chief was also made pursuant to the officer's official duties. The Pottorf case in Missouri. Statements made in internal affairs process about an officer's excessive force unprotected by First Amendment. Cheek versus Edwardsville, Kansas. Cooperation by two police majors in criminal investigation by an attorney general's office <coughs> but in a criminal investigation by the attorney general's office was unprotected by the First Amendment. 
the majors gave statements about alleged fixing of DWI citation by police chiefs. Interference by city council member with cocaine investigation and used by another city council member of his status to get free remodeling done on his home. All of those are clearly crimes. All of these are, are certainly within the law enforcement officer's obligation to report or participate in the investigation, yet doing so in this particular case got these officers terminated and they were not able to, re, uh, to get reinstated because of the Garcetti case. Sigsworth versus the city of Aurora. Police detectives report to his supervisors that he believed members of his task force broke the law by tipping off suspects. Again, not protected. It was made pursuant to his official duties. Officer testimony. <clears throat> These are officers who have either testified in court, in deposition, or in uh, grand jury. Since the duty to testify is the basic duty of every citizen, a police officer testing in court about his role in an investigation is testifying as a citizen and is potentially protected by the First Amendment. That's one that has actually gone in favor of the, um, of the officer, which is a rarity in this area. Testimony by police officer before grand jury as part of job is not protected by the First Amendment. That's in uh, Florida, in, uh, out of the city of Miami, the Southern District of Florida, the federal court there. <clears throat> Tennessee, I'm sorry, Tennessee, at a Western, the Western District of Oklahoma. Officers proposed testimony on behalf of accused in criminal trial involving shooting of a mayor's son constituted citizen speech. It's important to point out there that he was testifying in favor of a defendant, not as a police officer as part of his job duties in favor of the prosecution. That would be one of the things that we could point out would be different in this particular case. Complaints about fellow officers. First Amendment provides no protection to a police officer's report to supervisors of a fellow officer's potential misconduct because the report was made pursuant pursu to his official duty to report wrongdoing. You can see the pattern. If we can find a way to tie this directly to your job duties, then we're going to deny your First Amendment protection, says the court. <clears throat> Gibson versus Kilpatrick. Police chief acted pursuant to his official job duties when he reported to an outside law enforcement agency that Mayor had misused city gasoline card, and thus his report was not protected by the First Amendment. <clears throat> the Mississippi case. County police officers did not speak as citizens when they submitted a written report which detailed the beating of a restrained prisoner by a fellow officer. <clears throat> The First Amendment not implicated when deputy terminated for reporting criminal conduct of other deputies. <clears throat> Carter versus the Incorporated Village of Ocean Beach. First Amendment does not protect complaints about other officers who are drinking on duty. Amendment, First Amendment offers no protections to canine officer allegedly filed in retaliation for writing critical memorandum about cutbacks in canine duty. Now, this is a complaint about an internal policy. I can guarantee you, in just about every single case, if you are complaining about an internal policy, promotions are unfair, discipline is, is heavy-handed, um, we have bad hiring practices, we are not meeting minimum staffing, if you, any of those things, anything that involves something that is internal to the administration of the police department will never be protected by the First Amendment, with one exception, and that is where you can establish a, a um, and it's not corruption, it's in discrimination. If you can demonstrate a pattern of racial or gender-based discrimination inside a department, that has been found to be a matter of great public importance, even though it's a gripe about internal working conditions. If it involves your working conditions otherwise, it's considered an internal policy gripe, and it will not be protected by the First Amendment. No First Amendment protection for a police chief who complained to mayor about policies concerning detaining individuals without probable cause. And this is one that's both a policy issue and a crime issue because clearly if you're arresting people without probable cause, you're breaking the law. It's illegal. The fact that this officer uh, <clears throat> complained about it to the mayor was basis for his termination and he was not protected by the First Amendment. <clears throat> No First Amendment protection for major crime scene detectives who criticize department procedures concerning the operation of the unit. Another 2013 case, as was the last one, this one out of the Third Circuit, raising through chain of command protest of quota system part of Corporal's job, thus unprotected. I get a lot of calls, a lot of emails throughout the year 
we're using a quota system, what can we do about it? Whether or not the quota system is actually legal is a conversation for another day. More research is showing that it's very difficult to show quotas, and there are very few cases that actually establish that a quota system, number one, exists, and number two, is actually illegal. But here, complaining about it publicly would certainly be a, um, a problem, but this was one that just went up through the chain of command, which you would think would be the right way for things to be redressed. If you're in a collective bargaining uh, relationship, and you're negotiating a contract, and you have a labor management committee where you meet to discuss uh, working conditions and policies and procedures. Based upon these cases, I would strongly suggest that you negotiate into those contracts a provision that says that that's a uh, an safe haven or amnesty for anything that's said as long as it's within decorum and respect. If you uh, enter into these conversations with management and they decide that they want to retaliate against you for saying something about the way they're managing the department as part of what the labor management committee was set up to do, you still would have a just cause um, standard that would protect you that you uh, would certainly file a grievance on for being disciplined or terminated for lack of just cause. But yeah, I think you also need to put something into your contract that says that, um, that all parties agree that this is a protected First Amendment environment and you can get them to agree to that, then you might have a, another avenue of attack, possibly. But you certainly want to write the protection of the speech that you're engaging in the Labor Management Committee uh, in doing so. Matthews versus City of New York, another 2013 case. No First Amendment protection for officers who complained to precinct commanders that city stop and frisk policies were inappropriate. Now clearly, here again, we have a potential law violation that they're stopping for us to comply with Fourth Amendment law and other constitutional restrictions. Officer brought it to the, his um, concerns to his chain of command. Did not go outside the chain of command, did not go to the newspaper, did not talk to the editor. He brought it to his commanders and they said, uh, you're in trouble and the First Amendment didn't protect him. Misuse of funds. This again, obviously would be a criminal violation but yet the courts are again finding against the officers in these cases, or the employees, I should say. Fiscal manager for a workforce investment board lost his free speech lawsuit when the court concluded that complaints he made about the allegedly wrongful deposit and use of funds were made pursuant to his job and thus were unprotected under Garcetti. Public corruption. First Amendment does not prohibit retaliation against police sergeants who, pursuant to instructions of the mayor, reported results of corruption investigation to city council. So not only was he doing a lawful investigation, he was doing so at the direction of a, uh, his employer, his boss, the mayor, and then reporting the results of corruption to the investigation city council, and he apparently was terminated for that, and there was no First Amendment protection. Job duties. The scope of a police officer's job is a practical inquiry. Now, this is what we want to find out. What, if I'm speaking pursuant to my job as a police officer, what does that mean? <clears throat> the scope of a police officer's job is a quote-unquote practical inquiry that involves more than a simple analysis of the job description. Formal job descriptions often bear little resemblance to the duties an employee actually is expected to perform, and the listing of a given task in an employee's written job description is neither necessary nor sufficient to demonstrate that conducting the task is within the scope of the employee's professional duties for First Amendment purposes. Relevant factors include whether the employee communicated the concerns outside of the chain of command, whether the speech is contained in a routine report, or whether the speech contravenes the specific orders from the employee's supervisors. All of those things that are listed there from relevant factors to the end of the sentence would certainly be within your job duties, even though what you're talking about or complaining about or observing is something that to do something about it would be outside your job duties, so uh, as, this, as listed in your job description. Job descriptions are through many different uh, areas of analysis for different claims or complaints are routinely looked at as merely a guide, not an expectation of what you're supposed to do or, or limited to do during the course of your job. Job duties simply provide a, an overview and certainly not 
uh, are considered to be exhaustive or exclusive and for the purposes of a First Amendment lawsuit would not result in any definitive protection or result in any argument or give you any argument that you would be able to use to protect yourself in a First Amendment retaliation claim. So just because they say, the court says, well, we have to determine whether or not you were speaking as, a, as an employee, the fact that what you're talking about is not in your job description is irrelevant. <clears throat> police officers' comments to media after police pursuit and suspect crash were unprotected under Garcetti, even though the officer was not authorized to speak to the press. This, the point is not that, he, that the discipline wasn't appropriate because he was not authorized. The discipline may be appropriate because he did something he wasn't authorized to do. The point is, speaking to the media is not protected by the First Amendment, and the Garcetti analysis does not end just because, well, I'm not the information officer, therefore it wasn't my job duty, therefore I'm outside of Garcetti and the First Amendment protects me. This court says no, and most courts say no. The fact that the officer's statement was unauthorized by the department and that speaking to the press was not part of his regular job duties is not dispositive. In other words, that does not dispose of the question. <clears throat> Nixon's statement was made while he was performing his job. And the fact that he performed his job incorrectly in an unauthorized manner or in contravention of the wishes of the superiors does not convert his statement at the accident scene into protected citizen speech. I think that says it pretty clearly. I've been kind of repetitive on it, but it's sometimes a difficult um, topic to understand. Um, union speech. I get these questions all the time. Well, if I speak as the union president, am I protected? And the answer is maybe. Given the inherent institutional conflict of interest between an employer and its employee's union, we conclude that a police officer does not act in furtherance of his public duties when speaking as a representative of the police union. That is a generalized statement, and it's going to depend upon how you're actually framing what you're talking about and whether you're actively in a representation capacity at the time that you say something. <clears throat> Garcetti does not apply where statements made in deputy sheriff's capacity as union president. And then the rest of these cases basically all stand for the same proposition. If you're acting as your union president, then your speech is generally protected but we have to look very carefully at what you intend to say because of this case. In the Bergeron case, this is out of Massachusetts, the federal court held unprotected speech by a corrections union officer in direct mailings to voters criticizing a sheriff for her treatment of pension funds, holding that by disparaging the sheriff's management style, the plaintiff sought to advance the union's bargaining position for their benefit and the benefit of other union members. Now, Think about that. That is exactly what a union president does. That is exactly what the motivation is, to improve your bargaining position and to point out evidence and documentation of the, uh, management practices in an effort to improve your bargaining position. Well, in this particular case, they said because it, that was precisely what they were doing, that it wasn't protected. Although the public would likely be concerned with the revelations of discord and dysfunction in the sheriff's office, and this is bolded for a reason, the import of a plaintiff's message was of the plaintiff's message was diminished by their preoccupation with personal disagreements and internal disputes over the workings of the department. Plaintiff's speech did not purport to alert the public to a significant safety threat. They complained instead of pay raises given by the sheriff to her friends and the creation of a fiscal mess in the department. One of the major factors or major duties of a union is to ensure that all employees are treated equally. It's exactly what they were attacking in this particular case. Misuse of government funds that could have been better spent on employees, morale is down, you're only favoring a certain uh, group of people, you're not taking care of the bargaining unit as a whole. That is exactly what unions do. That's exactly what union officers are supposed to do. Well, this court found that that was absolutely not protected because the disputes were deemed to be more of internal working condition complaints that were personal in nature and not for the benefit of the public. There's a, a rank inconsistency in this case if you think about it. If you're not speaking as an employee but you're speaking as a union official, then whether or not it's a matter of great public importance is supposed to be irrelevant. But in this particular case, they said, yeah, you were speaking as a union, as a union official, 
that you were speaking about matters of internal gripes. I don't know how you can reconcile this. A union official is supposed to talk about internal gripes and working conditions. That's the union official's obligation under the duty of fair representation. So it just this is an exact example of why you can't look at one particular case and say, aha, this is my answer. I can now go forward and say what it is I wanted to say. All we can do is advise you to be extraordinarily cautious and talk to your lawyer before you say something. And you might be better off leaving something unsaid and taking it into the bargaining room as opposed to saying anything publicly. Off-duty speech. These cases are uh, also discussed in light of uh, employee, employee privacy. And the, the reason why we want to talk about them in this case is because there also is a speech element to them. But these cases were decided both on privacy as well as speech issues. In this particular case, this officer was uh, promoting an off-duty business where he sold videos of himself in a law enforcement-like uniform, engaged in various sexual acts, uh, both with others and by himself. <clears throat> he um, also had an email address and a website address that made a connection to law enforcement. Um, and it was something like code8leo.com uh, or something like that. But he was. He was involved. He was involving his job and his image as a police officer. Even though he didn't specifically identify his employer, it was clear that he was portraying himself as a uh, pornographic police officer. And the city of San Diego fired him. And the court said that far, there's a U.S. Supreme Court case, far from confining his activities to speech unrelated to his employment, Roe took deliberate steps to link his videos and other wares to his public or to his police work, all in a way injurious to his employer. The use of the uniform, the law enforcement reference in the website, the listing of the speaker as in the field of law enforcement, and the debased parody of an officer performing indecent acts while in the course of official duties brought the mission of the employer and the professionalism of its officers into serious disrepute. Dival versus the city of Chandler. This is a case we've been talking about for several years. Um, this was a, a case where an officer and his wife engaged in uh, sexual acts together and with third parties on various uh, doing various acts on the internet. When they were published, they did take steps to conceal the officer's identity, but not the wife's identity. In addition, when they looked at the website, they found at the, in one of the rooms where these acts were taking place, there was actually a plaque from the city of Chandler Police Department hanging on the wall, which further identified him. Members of the community were able to identify the officer's wife, even though they couldn't identify him, the plaque on the wall, and when the uh, media got a hold of it, it, it became apparent that this was a police officer. Um, the public outcry was pretty significant. The court also said that even though he went to great lengths to protect his identity, he didn't protect his wife's identity. And on top of which, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> on top of which, the ability for um, the media, the, the ability of the media to find out about it, which was only based upon the investigation itself and the fact that people inside the department conducting the investigation were talking to the media did not save this particular officer. Uh, the court basically said that maintaining a web page uh, was not protected by the First Amendment and allowed users for a free fee to view sexually explicit videos of Babel and his wife. And, the web, and even though it did not identify him as a police officer, when the department began investigating the matter, the media featured the story prominently. The media involvement was a significant issue with regard to the public response to his actions, which the uh, department was then entitled to rely on as a further basis for termination. That's why the media issue comes up. Because one of the arguments that was made in the case was, well, it, the media never would have found out about it if people conducting the investigation hadn't discussed it openly with the media. 
and the court said that the um, issue that the media found out about it, perhaps inappropriately, doesn't change the fact that the conduct itself, as demonstrated by the public's response, is inappropriate for a police officer uh, in in uh, public view. Now, there are some strange words in here like paraplus and pollution, but basically what the court is saying here is, regardless of how far uh, the public is willing to tolerate certain behavior, um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that what this officer do, was doing was well outside of those outer limits. And that's, I, I just include that quote in there because what the, what the court's saying is, okay, you might have gone right up to the line and stopped when you did some of these things, but the rest of what you did was well outside of what the public is willing to tolerate. And we don't need an expert witness to come in and tell us that it's outside of or inside of public uh, uh, tolerance. We can decide looking at something for ourselves to say that norm, a normal, reasonable person in the public eye would not behave this way, and therefore you shouldn't either. <clears throat> Off-duty firefighters had no First Amendment right to participate in a holiday parade that featured mocking racial, racial stereotypes. Um, there's a case out of 2006 where the officers actually um, uh, used blackface and and made other uh, stereotypical uh, racist uh, costumes and so forth when they uh, were in the parade. And the court said, uh, no, even though you're off duty and you're not there as firefighters, you're still not uh, protected by the First Amendment when there is a, a, any sort of connection or link as public employees who can be recognized in the public and in fact were and get reported to your department for behaving in an inappropriate and offensive way that you can't be disciplined for it. In this particular court, they said you absolutely can be disciplined for that. Now, I mentioned that we will be talking about a case um, that this, before the Supreme Court. It's Lane v. Franks. In this case, uh, Lane was a, um, he had a position in a public university that had a program paid, paid for by federal funds that he was overseeing that was those funds were to be used for a, a developmental educational program. He found in his audit of the program's funds that a, uh, a state legislator was on the payroll. It was a no-show job. She was just getting paid out of the funds of this program without doing any work, in fact, never even showing up at the institution. When he brought this to the attention of various officials, he was terminated for it. The government official who was taking the money was eventually indicted, and I believe she was convicted. But they, they still, in between, there was there was a grand jury uh, testimony, and there was court testimony. And in between the grand jury testimony and the trial testimony, Lane was terminated. He turned around and he sued for First Amendment. What he said was in his lawsuit was, I was subpoenaed to testify, and I don't have a Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, so I had no choice but to testify. I testified truthfully, but for my testimony, which was compelled, I would not have been terminated. The university officials even actually testified in his civil trial that he was, in fact, terminated for his testimony. I believe that's what they said. In any event, it was without question, it was directly tied to uh, his testimony because the termination, uh, in the termination retaliation lawsuit, the university did not put on any evidence and simply relied on the First Amendment not protecting this particular employee. It's currently before the U.S. Supreme Court and at issue is whether any public employee, not law enforcement, but a law enforcement employer may retaliate against an officer for truthful, compelled testimony. We don't know. We're waiting to find out. Based upon the way the oral hearing went, we believe that based upon the questions that were asked, that the Supreme Court is not looking very favorably on the issue of ordering someone upon penalty of termination or discipline to provide information and then turn around and firing them for it and not protecting them. Whether or not it will be protected under the First Amendment is one question. Whether or not there are, is a, a re, an ability to recover financial damages for the termination is 
a second question. But we're not sure how this will turn out, but based upon some of the questions that were asked by the justices, we're, we're hopefully optimistic that this will start to push back some of these ridiculous opinions that we've covered this morning, uh, here this afternoon. <clears throat> um, we're going to open it up now to questions. I don't have uh, any other case material to give you, but I wanted to leave more time for questions because we've been running over in some of these webinars, and I know that people are very concerned about these uh, Garcetti issues. So, PJ, if you can tell us what some of these questions are, we'll get right to it. Uh, we do have a question that specifically involves that Circleville that you mentioned earlier, and if it was a unionized agency or not. In which case? The Circleville. Don't know. Don't know if it was a unionized agency. Okay. Uh, there have only been three questions. Uh, there was that one we discussed prior to the call, which I believe we covered about the uh, FOP use of media and poking Why don't you ask me the question, and I'll see okay. if I can, I can answer it directly. Okay. Uh, it's when you have the – oh, let me jump ahead. Uh, as an FOP president with full-time release, I have created a jib-jab using the heads of elected officials and employees dancing together in a shirtless Chippendale style to music. I created this to show the relationship between an unsavory group of individuals who all work together against our officers. Best interest. Uh, could you discuss uh, the possible ramifications, if any, for publishing this masterpiece on social media outlets? I would not publish that based upon uh, the fact that, first of all, it's a lampoon. You're, you're taking a public image, which normally is not entitled to the protection of being um, mocked or criticized, but it's being mocked and criticized for the purpose of um, bringing to light unfair or unjust working conditions. Now, even though it's within the union's capacity to bring those issues to light, full-time release or not, it's within the union's capacity to do that, I'd be very concerned about the Bergeron case and how that case um, came out. There, they were clearly doing things that were well within a union's officials, a union official's um, duty to bring to light, but the manner in which it was done was most likely the focus. Instead of dealing with these matters through the union process, they were done through a publication in this particular case, talking to the media. Putting something on social media that not doesn't just criticize or bring to light certain practices, but actually paints uh, the union, uh, I'm sorry, the city officials or the county officials in, in a, uh, a mocking light would probably not be considered to be within the union officials' job duties and therefore could very seriously uh, uh, or could very well not be protected by First Amendment and could result in, in discipline that the courts would, would not look favorably, would, would look favorably upon, in other words, it would look favorably upon the discipline, not the activity or the speech. I believe that answers a couple of the other questions that popped up. Uh, now, here's another one. If a union officer or police officer gets fired for complaining about internal policies, there is no recourse for the officer to get his job back question mark. Number one, it's going to depend upon what you were, in which capacity you were speaking. Are you speaking as a union official or as a police officer? If you were speaking as a police officer outside of your union role, for instance, at the bargaining table, uh, then it's going, to be a, it's going to be a tougher case to defend. Secondly, what are you actually talking about? Are you talking about pay raises, promotions, internal policies? Those things are generally looked at uh, as not being protected by the First Amendment at all if you're talking as an employee. Now, if you are speaking to the media about what's going on in the collective bargaining, at the collective bargaining table, and management has already engaged the media and has painted the union in a negative light. I would say that, that first of all, I would not engage the media regardless of what management has said. But if you're inclined to do it or you've already done it, the argument that you would have to raise in court trying to get your job back under a First Amendment case would be that we were not speaking as employees, we were speaking as union officials, and we did not set the subject, employer did, when they brought these issues to the media. 
they brought up the internal policies and we responded to directly to statements that were made by management. Whether or not that would actually win the case remains to be seen, but you can see that the courts have had a lot of cases before them involving different types of speech that if it's clearly within the union's capacity to make the speech, the courts are in their favor. But that Bergeron case is out there, and as long as that case is out there, and there can be an argument made that the manner in which the speech was made, um, meaning directly to the media, um, in that particular case, turned it into more personal than professional in terms of it's personal to an employee, not professional in terms of that's what the union is doing or supposed to be doing, then I would have some concerns about another court looking at that opinion and saying, yeah, we agree, that's the analysis. It, it's, it's, I don't believe that talking to the media ever advances your cause as a union. I just don't believe, I've never seen it work. I know that there are certain instances where the public gets behind the union, shows up at meetings, et cetera, shows up, you know, rally behind police and fire, public safety employees when they go to meetings and uh, before the city or county commission, but uh, waging war with management over collective bargaining issues in the media is, first of all, I don't think it gets any results, and second of all, as we're finding, it's not necessarily protected the way we thought it should be. The, the next question we have is, I'm going to kind of combine two, is uh, basically, uh, is there an advantage or disadvantage to trying to do something anonymously or with a degree of protection that cannot be directly identified back to the officer? And is there any advantage to using retired employees that may not be subject to the employer's actions to voice uh, opinions or issues? Certainly, if, if speech is made by someone who is not employed by the agency, then you would um, be able to avoid that disciplinary uh, argument if, uh, or disciplinary scenario. If you do it anonymously, I'm not an expert on how all of this cyber stuff works, but I know it's very difficult to hide your identity on the internet. It's certainly hard to hide your identity when you're talking to another person who might easily feel the pressure and, or desire to, for whatever reason, disclose who you are. Uh, so I just, I don't know that, that, that there is any such thing really as being anonymous. Um, there is a case out of Dade County that was not in our slide presentation about a, an assistant state attorney who did public records requests about a case that was being prosecuted by his office. He published all of the documents that he obtained through the public records request. Then, at a later date, he went back into his, it was his blog, it wasn't, he wasn't hiding his, his uh, identity in any way, but when he went back into his blog several days later, he started making uh, editorial comments based upon the specific knowledge he had gained as a result of working in the office. The court said, had he stopped short of just publishing the public documents, which he was smart enough to get through a public records request, which would be available to any citizen, he took the, the next and fatal step of making comments that could only have been based upon his personal knowledge of being an insider, quote unquote, in the office and knowing what's happening as a result of the fact that he worked there. So how you uh, obtain the information is very important. How you present the information is very important. If you're going to rebroadcast uh, a uh, televised meeting of your city council, uh, for example, let's say you have a city council person who said something really uh, offensive about police officers. Uh, for, like, for example, the governor of Ohio talked about how an idiot cop wrote him a, a speeding ticket. If you were to take that video segment and put it on a loop and put it on your website, based upon the Dade County case logic or rationale, look, this is public information, this is a public official, 
We're not saying anything. We're simply broadcasting something somebody else said. Um, then I would think that under those circumstances that you would have uh, more protections under the First Amendment. But the moment you start making editorial comments about something that's already public information, or you start saying, you see, this is what we're talking about. This is why they, this is an unfair place to work, or they don't take care of us. The minute you turn it into a personal gripe, even though you might be griping on behalf of everybody in the department, it's still considered a complaint about internal working uh, uh, conditions, and therefore not protected by the First Amendment. Um, if you if there is information that you want the public to be aware of, say, let's talk about response times, public safety, minimum staffing type issues. The best practice that I can think of, and I'm not advising you do this, but my best practice that I can think of would be to have the retired members of your lodge do a very specific public records request in their name to have the information sent to their homes and then have them go make the public statement if you wanted to bring attention to it, to something of that nature. And by the way, the public statement made by Pickering in 1968 about classroom size is not at all different from a police officer today saying, we don't have enough police officers on the street. The public is in danger. That would be a matter of great public importance, wouldn't it? Well, interestingly, there is not yet a single court that has said that that public safety question is a matter of great public importance. It is more in terms of an internal gripe about an individual or group of police officers complaining about their working conditions because there there's too much work and not enough officers to do it. So that's one of those examples where you would think, wait a minute, this is a matter of public importance. It's public safety. It's the number of officers on the street. The courts have said over and over and over again that that is not a matter of great public importance. That is an internal gripe. So if you want to have some that if you want the public engaged on that subject, that is one of those subjects that you would want a citizen to do a public record request about the, the number of officers in the department, the number of officers per shift, and have that person then go to the media and say, well, the public's not safe, the sheriff's not doing a good job, the city's not, city the police department's not doing a good job protecting the public, et cetera. The moment you do it as a police officer, it is presumed that you know about that because you know how many officers you work with which is directly tied to your job duties. That's how you got the information. You wouldn't have done it any other way. End of story, not protected. I believe this may have already been addressed, but uh, the question is specifically regards in the statements made like in uh, internal affairs or LEO, LAO affairs, that's is it, whether or not that's protected or not. Whether what's protected? Uh, this, a comment or speech made during those investigations or processes. If you're ordered in and you give a statement and they turn around and fire you for making a statement even though you were ordered to and it was truthful, every case I've looked at has said that is not protected First Amendment speech because it's your job obligation to do it. We're waiting for the Supreme Court case to come down to see if that's going to be made a limitation of this Garcetti bastardization of the law. And it is. It is a bastardization of the law. So if the, the Supreme Court decides that it's completely unfair to compel someone to testify or give a statement under oath that's truthful in order to keep their jobs and then fire them for giving it, fire them for giving it that that should be a due process violation of some kind, if that's what the Supreme Court rules, then we can all sleep a little bit easier. As of right now, the unfortunate answer is yes, you can be fired for giving a truthful, compelled statement in an internal affairs investigation, um, even though you have no choice but to give a statement. Uh, there's a unique question in there that uh, can a union member be terminated or disciplined for voting no confidence in a police chief at a union meeting? For voting no confidence? Correct. Well. That, that brings another First Amendment issue uh, to the table. That, that case, that particular case, has actually been litigated. It's not a Supreme Court case, but it was actually a case out of Georgia. Uh, I, I can't think of the name of the case offhand, but they, that was deemed to be a First Amendment association right. And when, what happened was the, the police chief found out 
or we're trying to find out through an investigation who participated in the no contact, no confidence vote and how they voted, and the court said that that was a violation of the First Amendment freedom of association by trying to invade the provenance of the union, and therefore the investigation was halted and uh, no discipline was allowed to be pursued. So it's a, it's a related question, but when it's been attacked on an association basis, uh, First Amendment right to associate as opposed to First Amendment speech, it's been deemed to be protected. But those votes should be anonymous to begin with. So I wouldn't. I would never cast a, any type of vote that could potentially become public without it giving the individual voters uh, anonymity. Uh, I think there's possibly one, maybe two questions left. Uh, okay. The next question comes out to be uh, if using. I'm going to speak it verbatim. So. I apologize. Uh, using media is not necessarily protected. How about speaking with congressional members? Uh, for instance, a union president was asked by a congressman if certain funds made it to the department. Uh, is that something that will be protected, or is that still in that kind of public jurisdiction? Uh, I would rely on the case where you had um, the, the, sh the sheriff who went to the FBI. You have the sergeant who was directed by the mayor. Um, so I would say that no, those are not protected. Um, in the case of the police chief going to the FBI, that was one that the chief initiated. In the case of the uh, sergeant, that was one where the mayor, the elected official, asked him to do the investigation and then asked him to talk about it at city council. So there was no protection under those circumstances. So I would say based upon those cases that the answer is probably no. Mm -hmm. And I, I know it's going to be a rehash, but there's a unique factor in it. Uh, is a text message sent from one officer to another officer in which threats of physical harm toward the department command staff uh, be used, the text messages were found as a result of a criminal investigation? Well, it's interesting. If the, if the question is whether they have a right to, to obtain the text message and did so as part of a criminal investigation without a warrant violation of the Fourth Amendment. That, that's one, one aspect of the question. And I, it, it depends upon how they obtained it. If they obtained it through a, a consensual or voluntary search or if the department owns the cell phones and the accounts where the text message was passed and therefore obtained it as a result of policy which says you have no right to privacy in your text messaging or in your cell phone, um, that that would be that, that's one question. So you, you would either need a warrant or to have it voluntarily surrendered or it would have to be in the ownership of the HC to begin with. With regard to whether it is a First Amendment right to um, discuss threats, even if it was a mocking threat against your employer, one employee to another, uh, I think the court would have to take a look at the context in which it was made, whether you were on duty at the time that you made it, and if it's part of an internal gripe about the way those management officials are managing or the, the uh, agency or supervising the officers. Uh, if those questions are all resolved in favor of this was duty related, then even though it's well outside of a, an employee's job duties to uh, threaten the supervisor, I would think that the court would say there's no First Amendment protection. I think this is going to be another rehash, uh, but uh, it's uh, to what extent can the department control off-duty speech that is unrelated to employment? For example, an officer who is off-duty dressed in plain clothes at a restaurant bar uses a profanity in the presence of someone who knows the individual as a police officer on a topic unrelated to the police officer's employment. Uh, at what point does the employer cease to have an interest in order to enforce a courtesy rule which prohibits the use of profane, profane language? Yeah, now, that, now I think you're getting more into what could be protected. You're not griping about anything in particular. You, just, you, you utter something that somebody subjectively is offended by in a completely um, uh, off-duty setting that has nothing to do with um, um, 
community standards of obscenity. You know, it would depend upon the words that were used. Obviously, I mean, if you launched into a, a tirade for several minutes and a loud, drunken voice, and and you know, uh, behaved in a way that those of you who knew you were a police officer would have serious questions about your character, then that is something, and and would do enter into a balancing test in that regard. I mean, is what you are doing. Um, protected in terms of whether or not the agency's image or the image of all police officers because of your particular conduct on a particular day uh, weighs in favor of you being punished. Um, but if, if you dropped a couple of F-bombs in a bar where most people uh, are probably accustomed to hearing such language, you weren't in uniform, you didn't identify yourself, so someone just happened to know about it, or you were in an argument with somebody who decided they were going to get even with you because you disagreed with them for whatever reason, uh, I, I think the courts would have a much tougher time saying that that's not protected. Now, that's not to say we should all go out and, and, and demonstrate really bad, bad behavior in small communities where people know we're police officers because that, the smaller the community, the harder it is to win that case. Uh, you know, if you're a New York City police officer who happens to be sitting in a bar or somewhere uh, in New York in plain clothes and you get drunk and, and you start screaming and yelling about Eli Manning and saying something, you know, F-bomb related, I don't think you're going to have as big a problem as you would in Mayberry. Uh, I think that concludes most of the available questions. Uh, a but just to inform everybody that's currently on, a copy of the presentation and a video of the power of the presentation will be available probably on Monday. Uh, my hope is to get the video compressed and then uploaded and then available, if not Monday, then early next week. Uh, at what address? It'll be at FOP.net and it'll be under the article titled the name of this webinar. So fairly straightforward to okay. get a hold of. Thank you everybody for your time and attention. We're going to uh, as we said, this is part of a continuing program of Divisional Labor Services. Uh, the Labor Committee and President Canterbury have asked us to make these materials as available as we can and to present the, this information uh, as often as we can in a way that makes sense and is digestible. Hopefully we've served that purpose. If there are any questions that you think of after uh, the fact, send them into, uh, <coughs> excuse me, send them into uh, labor at fop.net and we'll get an answer to you as quickly as we can.